Last week, I spoke to you about the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. And we finished up on John chapter 19, and the natural progression of things brings us to John chapter 20. And as you know, typically when I preach, I preach a verse-by-verse exposition of the chapter, and I plan to do that. But before I do that, I want to just share with you an idea, a concept that God has laid upon my heart regarding the resurrection. When I was a little boy growing up, we didn't go on vacations. When you have nine children and uh, your father has some issues and you don't have a lot of money, how many of you know you don't take nine kids on? There, there was not a car available other than a large pickup truck that you could take nine kids on vacation. But I remember one time when I was a little boy, me and my brother Ken Jay and mom and pop, we went on a vacation to North Carolina up in the Tennessee. It's the only vacation I remember, but one of the things I remember most about it is not so much the sites we went to, but I remember one time I was with my dad and he stopped and pulled out his wallet to pay a bill and I had never seen such a water jack in my life. His wallet was stuffed full of money. I mean, it just stands out in my mind even today. Because how many of you know that back in that time, you had to carry enough cash for the gas, you had to carry gas, uh, cash for your food, to pay the hotel, any place you went, you had to carry cash for everything. So man, his wallet was thick with cash. How many of you know that when credit cards came along, that changed everything as far as the way that we pay th- for things? There are some people that travel with only their bank card and a credit card. They carry very little or no cash at all. And credit cards, when they became popularized and when the common man could get them, it completely changed how we transact business, especially in the United States. How many of you are aware of that? Well, I want to similarly say to you that when Jesus resurrected from the grave, it changed everything. I want you to understand that not only did it change things spiritually, but it also changed things physically. He made a change biologically. The molecular structure of things were forever transformed and changed at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He shifted the balance of power and restored the order that Adam had lost in the Garden of Eden when he forfeited dominion over to Satan. Now, I realize that when I make a statement like that, that Jesus restored the order and he uh, uh, restored the authority, a lot of us think, yes, I know that he uh, had authority over sin and over Satan and over death, and I know that he is seated up in the heavenly realms at the right hand of the Father, but it's wrong if we don't understand that that impact that he made was only upon the persons of the Godhead. I want you to understand the implications and the scope of what Jesus had in the resurrection was not only upon him, but also upon those that would believe in his name. So I want to talk to you this morning about the ramifications of the resurrection. That before we talk about what took place at the resurrection, I want you to understand what impact the resurrection had upon us as believers today. And if you would, turn over on the back of your bulletin. I printed the verses of Scripture I want to make reference to, and in the version I want to use today, the New Living Translation. But I'd like for us to read out of Ephesians four verses of Scripture that I've chosen there. And the Bible said, even before He made the world... God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now, let me just pause and let me ask you, when were you in Christ? Just look at the Scripture. It's not a trick question. Look at the verse of Scripture. When were you in Christ? Before he even formed the world, the Bible said he chose us. And we were in Christ even before the foundations of the world. Now, that's mind-boggling. But you have to understand that God lives outside of our time domain. 
He's not restricted. So he knew those that would choose him and those that he has chosen as well. So I want you to know today that you and I have been in Christ even before the stars were hung in the sky. We have been in Christ according to the word of God. And God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. How many of you know that God wants us now to understand the will of God? It's a mystery, but he's revealing the will and the plans and the purposes of Jesus Christ and their good plans to heal, to save, to deliver, and he's revealing his will to us. Verse 19. And he goes on to say, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. He says, I pray that you will understand, and this is my prayer today, that before you leave today, you will understand the ramifications of the resurrection. What is the tremendous power that is in Christ, but that is also in you and me? Look what it goes on to say. You see, the problem is we don't understand the greatness of that power. And so that's why Paul is saying, I pray that you'll understand. My prayer today is that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. And notice what it says. This is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, if you've got a pen or something, you're taking notes, underline the word the same. It's the same power. Are you listening? It's not almost like the power. It's not nearly. He didn't say it's similar to. He said it's the same power power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places is at work in you and me today. Hallelujah. Amen. This same mighty resurrection power is at work in us. The greatest event in all of human history that changed the power and the potential for life, that allowed us to be saved, that allowed us to be delivered from bondage, that allows us to be healed, that gives us access into the presence of God, that same power, the Bible said, is at work in us right now. Now see, the reason the response is so muted is because We hear that statement and we say, yeah, I know that that same power is working in me, but you understand, I've got these struggles. i got these issues. I, I have these weaknesses and these propensities, so there is no way that that same power of the resurrection can operate in me. That is wrong thinking, and it is bad theology, and that is what is handicapping the church today. God wants the church to be a church of power. Amen? Every believer was created to be a person of power. Every believer. Not just the elders, not just the ones that minister on the platform. You were designed by God to be a person of power. Now, 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 now see, when you hear that, a lot of times your hackles go up, your defenses go up, and, 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 you, and you approach this idea of you being a person of power, you want to be cautious, and you say, well, pastor, are you saying we're supposed to be power mongers? Because we have all seen what power can do to people. We've all seen people that rise to a position of power, good people, But when they get to the position of power, somehow they get corrupted. They get polluted. And we have seen, even within this church, when God gifted people with gifts and powers, what happens, how it can be corrupted and almost destroy a church. So we kind of, we become power shy instead of becoming powerful. We tend to shy away from power. 
But I want you to understand why is it that God wants you to be a person of power? Now look at your neighbor and just tell him God wants you to be a person of power. Did you mean it? Why does God give people such power? I'm talking about the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Are you with me? The same power is operating in us. Why does God give people power? Why did God give Joseph power? Was it so that Joseph, he could have a nice palace? Was it so that Joseph could could, uh, have the riches of Egypt? God made Joseph second in command behind Pharaoh, gave him the ability to interpret dreams and understand things in the Spirit so that he could help people. There were people that were going to starve to death. The nation of Israel was at risk of dying off, and God gave him that power so he could help people. Why did God give Moses power so that when he raised his rod, the water would turn into blood, that the Red Sea would part? Was it so that he could stroke Moses' ego and he, uh, he could go down in the history books as being a man of great power? No. It was so that Moses could help people. The people were in bondage and they needed a deliverer. Why was it that God anointed his son Jesus with such power that Jesus would say in Luke 4 and 18, he has anointed me so that I could give uh, healing to the sick, the recovery of sight to the blind, the setting of the oppressed uh, to go free. I could preach the good news to the poor. Why did God give Jesus that power? It is to help people. So, let me ask you, why do you think God wants you to flow in the resurrection power today? Come on, say it out loud. Why does God want you to have power? To help people. It's not wrong to desire and to walk and to trust that the power of God is operating in your life. Now, you can have the wrong motivation You can take it and twist it and get corrupted, but you need to understand that God wants you to be a person of power, and not just any power. I'm not talking about governmental power. I'm not talking about the power that wealth generates in our society. I'm talking about the same power that raised Christ up from the dead. Hallelujah. But see, part of our problem is Why are you having trouble grasping this is how do you view yourself? How do you view yourself? Do you view yourself as a human being who has spiritual experiences? Or B, do you view yourself as a spiritual being who has human experiences? Now, don't answer out loud, but answer that question. Do you view yourself as a human being who has spiritual experiences, or do you view yourself as a spiritual being who has human experiences? Now, see, if you choose A, A sounds something like this. Well, we're all sinners saved by grace. How many times have you heard that? Huh? Too many times. And you know what? It's a true statement. But that is a different statement than if you go to B. See, A says we're all sinners saved by grace, but B says I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I know who I am. I've been bought by the blood, and when God looks on me, he looks upon me through the cross, and it's just like he sees his son Jesus. How many of you know those are two totally different mindsets? They're both true, but one is a totally different mindset. I want you to know, church, we aren't just human beings that have spiritual experiences every once in a while when the Holy Ghost blows in here on a given Sunday. God created us as spirit beings. We have a soul and we live in a body, but we are primarily spirit beings. Somebody understand that? Say amen. Now, God is spirit, the Bible said. God is spirit. And those that worship him have to worship him in the flesh. Those that worship him have to worship them with their emotions. We have to worship him how? In spirit and in truth. 
So we have to hear the truth of the Word of God, the Logos and the Rhema, but we also have to engage with our spirit being. Now, God made us, according to Genesis 126, we are made in His image. Now, if God is a multidimensional God, and we talk about three dimensions and four dimensions and all that, really, we don't know how many dimensions God is in. He is unlimited dimensionality. He, he's infinite. We can't describe the, the, the greatness of God. But yet, if we are made in the image of God, we have to understand that there is a multidimensionality even to ourselves. Thank you, Francis. You're thinking too hard. There is a multidimensionality to us. We're made, he's a multidimensional God. We're made in His image. We have to have that same characteristic. Now, in our body, our body can only be one place at one time. I've tried, Larry, as hard as I can. But I can only be one place at one time. Sometimes I wish I could clone myself, but my wife says, no, devil. <laughs> my body can only be one place at one time. But you know what? Even in my soul, my mind can go places that my body can't go. I can be watching a Western on TV, and I can go back to the 1800s. In my mind, I'm right there. Or I can watch Star Wars. I can, in my mind, I can go forward into the, into the future. I can go places all over the world just in my mind. But I'm still limited to one locale inside my body. But now, what about my spirit? Now, don't get spooked on me now. And I want to make sure you know I'm not talking about astral projection. I'm not talking about some pagan practices. But what about my spirit? What dimension is our spirit limited to? Oh, I got your interest now. Let's go back to our example, our great example, Jesus. When Jesus is dying on the cross, he makes two statements that are very interesting. On the one hand, he says to his father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And at the same time, while he's on the cross, he says to the thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but those are two different places. Those are two separate places. You see, if God is omniscient, all-knowing, and God is omnipotent, all-powerful. If He is omnipresent, that means that He can be all places at all times. Not only is He us with us here right now, but He's also over in Kenya. He's also over in Panama. He's all over the world. He is present, and He's answering prayers. He's moving wherever people are calling upon Him. He's everywhere all the time. He is multidimensional. But up until the resurrection, everybody who died, every spirit, went to a place called Sheol. Now, that was the Old Testament place of the dead, and Sheol was a place where the spirits of men, when they died, their spirits went, and they stayed there, and it was divided into two sections. First of all, you had a section that was called Abraham's bosom, because Abraham was the father of all who believed. It was also called paradise, and that was the place of the righteous dead. It was the people that believed in God. It was the people that uh, practiced righteousness, those that were looking forward to Messiah. They went to this place where the righteous dead stayed. But on the other half, on the other side of Sheol, there was a place known as Hades, and Hades contained the evil dead, the spirits of those that were evil, those that didn't believe in God, those that rejected God, those that worshiped idols, those that worshiped foreign gods. And when Jesus dies, his spirit obviously goes to be with his Father because he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit, but his spirit also went down to Sheol. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us so. In 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19, it says, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. 
He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the what? In the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, this prison means a confinement, a holding place, because until Jesus resurrected, nobody else could resurrect because Jesus had to be the first fruits of the resurrection. So Jesus goes down to this place. His spirit goes down there. His body is still within the tomb. It's going to lay there for three days. We'll talk about that in a minute. But while his body is still in the tomb, his spirit, somehow, part of it goes, or, 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 or one, of, one of the dimensions of his spirit goes into the presence of the Father, but then another part goes down into the very core of the earth, and he's preaching to Job. He said, Job, you remember when you said, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at the last day. I'm standing here right now before you. David, do you remember how you said that the Lord is your shepherd and yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll fear no evil for thou art with you. I am with you right now. I'm standing here right now. Isaiah, do you remember when you prophesied that, um, that he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied? I'm here because the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice and the travail of my soul at Calvary. And I'm here today to declare, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the Messiah. I'm the anointed one. I'm the one you were looking for. And you just hold on a few more moments, a few more days, and I'm going to lead you out of this place. Then he turned over to the other side, and he began to preach to them. And he told them about all the opportunities they had to receive God, all the chances they had to, to turn their lives over to God, to obey God, but they rejected him, and he preached to them as well. I don't know about you, but I wanted to be on the first side. Amen? But now he has to leave them in that prison, or else he preaches for three days. I don't know. But he waits until he resurrects from the dead. Now, why was it three days? Why was Jesus' body in the grave for three days? First of all, it was because of belief among the Jews that it took three days for the spirit to depart the body. You remember when Jesus was called to the tomb of Lazarus and he waited four days? How many of you remember that? Right? Why? Because he wanted the people to know that Lazarus was dead and gone. He didn't want anybody to say, well, his, you know, he really, really wasn't dead. His spirit never left him. He just kind of resuscitated. He waited four days on that occasion. So one of the reasons he waited three days is because of the Jewish beliefs that uh, they believed that it took three days. So he wanted to know that his spirit had departed. But secondly, he had to fulfill Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, which hadn't been written at the time, talks about how that Jesus had to rise on the third day to fulfill the Scripture. If you look at Hosea 6, 1 and 2, and if you go back to Genesis 22, you'll see that Abraham was a type for three days. He considered his son as dead when he went up the mountain. So we have these types and these scriptures. So Jesus had to fulfill the scripture and wait for three days. But also, he had to wait three days to fulfill his own words. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, for, uh, or, or the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So it had to fulfill even his own words. But once Jesus rose up out of that grave, he goes down to Sheol, and he gives all those righteous dead a free pass, a get-out-of-jail-free card. Hallelujah. And they come up out of that place, and something really strange happened, and we read about it in the Scripture. The Bible said that not only did Jesus resurrect, but it said, and the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who were died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This was the original version of Day of the Living Dead. Could you imagine going into Jerusalem to buy some fruit, to buy some vegetables or whatever, and you come home and you tell your wife, honey, you know it's the strangest thing, but I saw Uncle Marvin today. She said, you're kidding me. We buried him six years ago. I know, but I talked to him. He told me he had seen Jesus. Can you imagine? But let's move forward. So what are the ramifications? We're talking about the ramifications of the resurrection. Was it only those that were in Sheol that had this impact upon them? 
Were they the only ones that had the ability to be transported to reclaim their bodies? The answer is no. Let me give you some examples. There's a multidimensionality to our existence, and we see this in the lives of Philip in the Bible. The Bible said he was baptized in the Ethiopian eunuch, and suddenly, the Bible said, the Spirit snatched him away. His body, soul, and spirit disappeared from that point and appeared suddenly in another place called Azotos. We read about Paul. Paul wrote these words. He said, I was caught up into the third heaven. Now look what he said. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. So we don't know that his spirit left or his spirit and body. We don't know, but we know that he was translated and went to another place. He went into another dimension by the spirit of God. When we read about John, John says, a door was opened up in heaven, and I heard the voice of him that said, come up here, and I'll show you things which must come hereafter. And he said, all of a sudden, I was in the spirit before the throne of heaven. How did he get off the Isle of Patmos, and suddenly he's up before the throne room of heaven? It's because the Spirit of God, when Jesus resurrected, he changed everything. He changed the molecular structure. He changed the ability of transportation. He superseded time. Are you understanding this, church, that we are not limited to the finite experiences of this earth? Hallelujah. Oh, some of y'all are spooked out already. Where can your spirit go? It can go anywhere that the spirit of Jesus Christ wants it to go. How is it that you're, you're, let me give you something you'll believe because you ain't believing this. Let me put it on simpler terms. How is it that you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you see somebody's face and that face is troubled, and you get out of your bed, and you drop down on your knees, and you start interceding for so-and-so and so-and-so, and and the next day you reach out to so-and-so, and and you said, man, God woke me up in the middle of the night. They said, thank God. I was almost in a car accident. I came this close to losing my life. It must have been your prayers. It must have been the Spirit of God that troubled you. Does anybody hear what I'm talking about? Amen. How many of you have had that, or you've heard those experiences like that? You've heard me tell the story. My wife is in trouble with delivering my son and a woman we haven't talked to in years. We didn't even have her phone number. She called the church to ask where we were. Was Pam all right? We were in trouble down at Roper Hospital, and Fran gave the number, and Sister Baber called my wife and said, God, put you on my mind today. I've been praying for you, and I want you to know everything's going to be all right. And tears streamed down our faces, and we knew the spirit of the living God had woken up that woman and let her know of our case so that she could intercede on our behalf. He's revealing mysteries to us. You read it. He's revealing the mysterious will of God's Son so that we can know these things. When have you ever been transported? How many of you have heard testimonies of somebody said, I was driving through, somebody came through, that, came through the intersection, they didn't obey the red light, and I have no idea how I didn't get creamed and get uh, my car. How many of you have heard testimonies like that? Something happened. The Spirit of God had to transport, had to take control and move you and shift you out of the dimension you were in into another dimension. When you have visions, when you have dreams, your spirit is taking you places That your natural mind and your natural body cannot go. At the very least, thank God. You know, God orchestrates things. Did you hear what our sister Lizelle said this morning when she was leading worship? She was saying that all we're doing is orchestrating what's happened in the heavens. Right? How many of you know that there's worship going along in heaven 24-7? Right, So that when we sing and lift up our voice and lift up our praise to God and lift up our prayers, the Bible said he's got vials, he's got bowls, he's collecting those prayers in. At the very least, what we're doing here on this earth has an eternal element to it that's going up into the heavens and we're joining with the angels and the seraphim and the cherubim and our worship has an eternal component to it. Hallelujah. It will never cease from the memory and the mind of God we live in a dimension beyond this world 
Amen? Because when Jesus died and resurrected, he broke every barrier that was imposed upon man by sin, by the devil, and by the grave. And he restored proper order so that the Spirit has rule over our flesh. Why are we fasting? Because we want the, uh, the enemy to know and we want God to know that we understand this principle. That our, that our flesh has to be submitted and subjected to our spirit. Hallelujah. I'm trying to get you somewhere. The Bible said God raised you up up with Jesus and has seated you with him in the heavenly places. Our spirit, hear me now, your spirit is inexorably linked to the spirit of Jesus Christ. Not based on my opinion, based on the word of God. You died and the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one. Who knows who that one is? The one who was raised from the dead. There's that resurrection power, and your spirit is linked to his spirit. You can read it again, Colossians 3 and 3. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. Now, let me go back when I first read the Scriptures. How long have you been in Christ? Before the foundations of the world. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. And his spirit lives in us and lives through us. But if Christ is seated at the right hand of God on high in the heavenly places. And the Bible said that the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool in Isaiah 66 and 1. How does Jesus do ministry here on the earth? Well, if that's my footstool and my foot is on it, how many of you know that that foot is not my head? Come on, wake up. How many of you know that my foot is not my head? Jesus is the head of the body, according to 1 Corinthians 12. And the Bible said that we are the what? The body of Christ. Last time I checked, my foot was a part of my body. So he is up on the throne, but remember he's multidimensional, and somehow his body expands throughout all of the galaxies, all of the universe, down through the Milky Way galaxy, past all of the planets, comes down and comes through the body, and he operates in this earth through you and me because his spirit is forever joined and linked to our spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that when people see you, they get a glimpse of heaven. Yes, when somebody is around you, they get a picture of Jesus. Woo! That'll make you change your mind about the way you treat the cashier that's so slow at the register. Huh? We're Jesus to the world. I'm not saying we are Jesus. There's only one Jesus. But we are Jesus. We are his ambassadors. We are his representatives. That's why Jesus said to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. How's it going to happen? It's going to come through us. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. He didn't say it's coming. He said it's in you now by my spirit. I'm telling you, if this don't excite you, you need to ask yourself, something's wrong with you. You don't understand the ramifications of the resurrection. This, listen, this isn't just another flowery message I'm preaching to float your skirt up. This is a truth of God. 
This is something that God wants you to begin to walk in. But to do it, you got to change your mindset. You see, that old man, that fearful man, that stubborn man, that uh, weak man, that unbelieving man no longer lives. Galatians 2.20, listen what the Word of God says. My old self has been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. Well, then who's living? Huh? But Christ lives in me. My old self has been crucified with Christ so that I no longer live, yet Christ lives in me, and the life which I now even live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am a new man. You are a new creation. Not restored, not rehabilitated, not revamped. If any person be in Christ, he is a brand new creation. The Bible said all things have become new. Hallelujah. My body is new. My mind is new. My spirit is new. And the power that I walk in is a new power. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody give him praise. You live, you breathe, you walk by the resurrection power, bless God. You see, my old man is hesitant to pray for people. Huh? That old man, he's kind of a scared to pray healing for people. He thinks in unbelief, well, what if nothing happens? What if they don't want you to pray for him? That's how my old man, that's how he talks. But the Christ in me, he ain't a scared at all to pray for people. Did you hear me? The Christ in you is not afraid to walk up to somebody and say, did you know that my God can heal you of that? I got about 50% that believe it. God, help me. I still got about 20 more minutes left. Help me to convince the other 50%, God. I'm talking about the ramifications of the resurrection. The spirit of the resurrected Christ is in you, operating through you. Amen? So that Jesus would say that the works that I do even greater works than these shall you do in my name because I go to the Father. You hear there's a message of the resurrection. In other words, because I'm going to be resurrected and go to my Father, the works you see me doing, he's got confidence that the Spirit of Christ that lives in us will do even greater works than he did when he was on the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, the problem is we're too focused on that old man. Now, just imagine with me for just a moment. Let's imagine I got my old man behind this door number one. Behind door number two is the Christ in me, the resurrected power, the new life, the new man. Hallelujah. Oh, you're great. You're beautiful. Wow. Now, here's our problem. Here's our problem. We think we got to keep an eye on this old man. What you doing now? Hey. Oh, my. You won't believe what this old guy's done. We think we got to worry about him. We got to keep an eye on him. Oh, get, get back in here. Hey, huh? no, you can't go out there. We feel like we got to command him. we got to try to control him. And all of our attention, all of our time is spent focusing on the old man. We testify about the old man. You wouldn't believe what I'd done the other day. I was flipping through the channels and these hoochie coo girls was doing cheerleading. I, I watched it. I'm so ashamed of myself. We testify about the old man. Now listen to me. 
Multitasking is a myth. You cannot multitask. They know that scientifically. Your mind either focuses on one thing and then it shuts down and does the other, but you can't drive and text at the same time. That's why they're making a law against it. Now, follow me. You can't multitask in spiritual things either. You can't be focused on the old man all the time, talking about what the old man's done, testifying about the old man, and expect the Christ in you to grow. Hey, you hungry? You want some pizza? I got some Holy Ghost pizza. I got some praise and worship anchovies. You see what I'm saying? If I'm always running to that door, I'm not going to pay enough attention to this one. This is where we want to live. This is the one that's living in us. That guy's dead. He said, my old man has been crucified with Christ. What you need to do is you need to pull the plug on that sucker. Amen? You got him on a breathing machine. You're giving life to him. Am I helping somebody? Now, how do we apply? If, this, if, if what I'm telling you is the truth, how many of you it does you no good to hear this truth and if you don't apply it? So how are you going to apply this truth? Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth, and he's given some supernatural, spirit, spiritual, enlightening teaching. He's teaching things that was blowing the people's minds, things they'd never heard of before. We can go into another dimension? Oh. What? You mean we're not limited? You mean our spirit can go places I can't go? Oh, I don't know if I believe that. That's the kind of teaching he was doing. I'm not saying it was the same, but it was different than what they'd heard before. It was a little bit disturbing to them. They weren't certain about it. They were going to have to go look up some of the scriptures he quoted. Go ahead. I want you to. I beg you to. Don't take my word for it. Be like the Bereans who studied. Go to the Holy Spirit. Ask him. But he's teaching in his hometown, and he's teaching these mind-blowing things about things of the Spirit. And directly after a while, they start thinking, hey, somebody said, isn't that Mary's boy? Somebody says, isn't that Joseph, the carpenter's son? Isn't that the same boy that grew up? Isn't that the same boy that used to run around with his little snotty nose around here? Yeah. Who does he think he is telling us these things? And they ran him out of town. Now listen to what Jesus said about it. In Matthew chapter seven, uh, 13, verse 57, he said, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own family. A prophet, in other words, receives honor except when he's among those that know him, his own family, his own hometown. That's what he was experiencing. And in the next verse, he says, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, remember, Jesus already said, the works that I do, even greater works than these shall you do in my name. There's two things here that you need to know if you're going to apply these truths to your life. The first one is honor. A prophet is not without honor, except in his home country. And the second one is faith. He did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. Now, when you hear the word honor, we tend to think of it in terms of to hold in high regard. Today, while we were singing, we said, Lord, we give you glory and honor. But let me me explain it to you like this. If I go into a store and I say to the man, I say, look, I've got a coupon here for 50% off, and the man says, I will honor it, I will validate it, I will recognize it as being worth, I will maintain my agreement with that coupon. That's what he means when he says, I'll honor it. Are you following me? 
If you go before a judge with a petition and the judge says, I will honor your request, it means he will recognize it. He will allow it to stand. So let's understand this word honor means to validate, to recognize, to grant, to keep an agreement. So what you have to do today, if you want to see this, you have to honor these truths as being true. Is this just another sermon that you're going to walk out of and say, wow, that was a good service today? Or are you really going to honor this and say, you know what, I believe that. I believe that the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that's what's operating in me. That's, what, that's how he wants me. To, that's how I'm going to be effective in ministry. You have to honor it as being true. You have to validate it. You, you, you have to recognize, you have to treasure it, that what Christ did through the resurrection, you have to believe it. At some point, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is not just something that's going to happen after you die. Help me, help me, somebody. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is now. That the Christ in you, and he is in you, he said that my spirit is tied with yours. Christ in you is what's producing glory in you right now. To the point that we're supposed to be going from glory unto glory unto glory. Amen. It's not just all after we die. There's some glory that God wants to demonstrate in the earth. He wants you to have his power so you can help somebody now. So first of all, you have to honor it. And then secondly, you have to have faith. At some point, you have to believe that Christ wants to use you in the resurrection power. Amen? Faith is the currency of heaven. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. Faith is what activates the divine exchange. Faith is that which takes that from the spiritual realm and these concepts and these ideas that I'm talking to you about, about the ramifications of the resurrection, and moves them out of the spirit realm, out of the conceptual realm, and brings them into the reality of the world in which we live in. Faith is what causes the unseen to become seen in our world. Amen? Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. Choose to believe that Christ's resurrection power is working through you. Now, let me make one last point about faith. Jesus always responds to faith. If you're waiting for a miracle, if you're waiting for an answer to prayer, if you're waiting for God to use you, and you're just hoping that maybe out of mercy or out of his grace, or one day you're just going to suddenly walk under a glory cloud, there's a chance that'll happen. There is a chance that it will happen. But when you come to him in faith, he always answers when people come to him in faith. Now, see, you're struggling with that. You think I'm making that junk up? No. The woman with the issue of blood, she said, she said before she ever got, if I can just lay a hold of the hem of his God, I know, I know in my spirit, I know I'll be made whole. And she touches the hem of his garment, virtue flows out of it, and Jesus said, woman, your faith has saved you. The centurion, you remember? He comes up to Christ. He said, I've got a servant that's sick. He said, I'll go heal him. He said, no, Lord, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. You just speak the word. I'm a man under authority. I know what authority is all about. All you have to do is give the command. You speak the word, and I know my servant. Jesus said, whoa, look at him, look at him, look at him. I've never seen such great faith like this in all of Israel. And he told the man, go. And the Bible said that his servant was healed that selfsame hour. Why? Because he came to him in faith. Oh, yeah, but his mercy, I'm liable to get his mercy, his grace, his love. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many of you know that Jesus loves everybody? Right? He goes to the pool of Bethesda. How many people at the pool of Bethesda does Jesus love? Everybody there. But there's only one man 
that he walks up to, they're all sick and impotent, paralyzed, been laying there a long time. Where was the mercy? They didn't have faith. Their faith was in the stirring of a water and not in the Son of God. But there was one man there that when Jesus looked at him, he said, do you believe? And he, asked, and he raised up his level of faith and he healed one man. The, left, the rest of them, he left there sick and impotent and paralyzed. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're looking for something to happen out of the realm of mercy and grace, it's a possibility because he's a good God. But if you walk in faith, when you demonstrate faith, he moves every time. How do we apply these truths? One, we hold these truths dear. We honor them. Secondly, we believe them and then we act on them in obedience so that the next time the Spirit of God prods you and says, I want you to go and pray for that, but for God, I don't know him. I want you to go and pray, but Lord, I mean, you know, I've never done that before. I want you to, instead of, instead of going to this old guy over here, what do you think? You think I should go pray for him? Oh, I knew it. No, I, I'm just not ready for that. Hello? Y'all ain't helping me at all. We run to this one. Jesus, is that you? Je- Je- Jesus, are you telling me to go pray for the person? I, I don't know. I-, I don't know. I've never done it before. But if you're telling me to do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Woo! Here we go. Come on. Let's go. Me and you, Jesus. Right. You see the difference? Stand to your feet, please. What are the ramifications of the resurrection? I want you to say these with me out loud. I'm going to put them all up there. We're going to say them one at a time. Are you ready? Let's say the first one. Same power is working in me. Look at your neighbor and tell them, the same power is working in you. What same power? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, you turn around back at your neighbor, and you look like you got a little more belief and a little more faith and a little more that you understand this. You point your finger at him if you've got to, and you say, the same power is working in you. There is no junior Holy Spirit. Now, let's say the next one. This power is to help people. Say it again. This power is to help people. Next one. There is a multidimensionality to my existence. We're going to have to say that one three times because y'all didn't get that at all when I was preaching it. You was looking at me like a calf staring at a new gate. What on earth is he? He done lost his marbles now. Let's say it again. There is a multidimensionality to my existence because you're a spirit being. Say it one more time. There is a multidimensionality to my existence. Next one. I died with Christ. Now I'm eternally linked to his spirit. Last one. Christ's spirit in me produces mighty works. Father, as we have declared these things, we say, let it be so. We're not interested in hearing a good sermon, hearing scriptures quoted. God, we're interested in advancing the kingdom of God. And Lord, we want you to know from our hearts, we honor these truths. We hold them in high regard. And we want you to know we recognize them as being true. We want to validate them. We want to honor and recognize them as a people, as a congregation. And God, I pray that in faith, as your spirit rises up in us, we will be obedient to the Christ in us. And Lord, for everything that you do through us, the mightier works that you said we would do, 
we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. And all the people said, amen and amen and amen.